our next event, so everyone won't wait too long. So we're going to have welcome remarks uh, delivered by head of biology department, Mr. Sapto. You may open your yeah camera again and give us the welcome remark. The screen is yours, sir. Okay, Levina, thank you very much. You look beautiful today. Uh, that's thank you, sir. Uh, one of the most uh, clever students of my uh, of our department. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. I'm now here in uh, in uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I've uh, been <laughs> around the Langkawi for a workshop. It's uh, one of the most beautiful islands in Malaysia. And then I'm just lucky enough to have a, a chance to uh, give talk there in the marine ecology and biotechnology. Uh, thank you very much for Dr. Jordan Casey uh, from the Department of Marine Science, the University of Texas Marine Science Institute, US. So it's really glad yeah, to meet you. And uh, thank you also for Ibudita who uh, organized this event very well. Without your effort, that could be not happen. Uh, today, there will be very uh, nice topics. It's about molecular approach. Uh, for me, it's a, a bit, uh, <laughs> it's a very serious uh, uh, topics <laughs> because uh, I'm an ecologist. Uh, I'm just doing in a structured community rather than in very molecular <laughs> approach. But this one is the, uh, for me, is a very important aspects in marine ecology and also in marine biodiversity and the also addressing tropic interaction, right? So um, to complete the competence of the students, uh, we regularly invite the international lecturer around the world to just uh, give talk, give uh, point of views and give experience what they are they are doing uh, in this project and by this we hopefully uh, uh, you know can sh get the uh, information and the students can get the uh, you know uh, 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 knowledge uh, skills yeah at least uh, to know uh, what the people doing a uh, researcher doing around the world and then get inspired by that so uh this is very nice topic, and uh, hopefully there will be fruit, fruitful discussion on this topic after that. So again, thank you very much for Dr. Jordan Casey uh, from Department of Marine Science. Uh, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So thank you very much for Mr. Sabto for the welcome remarks, the heartwarming welcome given to us. So let's proceed to our next event. We're going to straight ahead, going to the main session in today's international thematic lecture of the series two. Uh, so, but before that, I'm going to read to you our moderator um, curriculum for day today. So your, your moderator today is Ibu Nika Dita Cahyani. She is currently a lecturer in Biology Department, Faculty of Science and Mathematics, Diponegoro University, and she her field is in molecular ecology. Her educational background, uh, first of all, she got her PhD degree in biology, ecology, and evolutionary biology, or EEB Department, University of California, in 2021, and she got her master degree and in Master of Science and Master Program of Environmental Study, postgraduate program Udayana University in 2007 and she got her bachelor degree in biology faculty Gajah Mada University uh, in 2003. She got some of selected publications. I can see list of it and I cannot mention every one of it because it's too much. Um, and also I'm going to maybe explain a little bit of her skills here. She got skill in application of various molecular techniques such as DNA isolation and amplification using PCR. Another skill of her is in 
phylogenetic and statistical analysis using the NASP, Mega X, Arlequin, and so on. And the next skill that she has is in next generation sequencing pipeline using QWIME2, you search, research, and so on. So as you can see, um, your moderator here today is really a reliable person to guide the moderation, to guide the discussion in the day's uh, lecture series. So for Ibu Dita, I think she is already standing by and prepared. I hope everyone's still anticipating this main session. Prepare yourself. So without further ado, for Ibu Dita, the screen is yours, ma'am. Thank you, Levina. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, good morning, everybody, and good afternoon, uh, Jordan. I'm so sorry that this is a little bit late, a little bit late for you there. Uh, so I just want to thank everybody, the students and also the lecturer that come here today. So um, today we would like to welcome Dr. Jordan Kessy from the University of Texas Marine Science Institute, USA. Um, Jordan, that's how I usually call her, um, is not only my colleague, she's, uh, is just a good friend of mine and my mentor during my PhD lab work in Washington, D.C. actually. So um, Jordan, thank you for coming and uh, we really appreciate your time. I'm so sorry for um, the late time. Uh, but before we start, I would like to read um, a little bit CV of Dr. Jordan Casey. Um, okay, let me just share screen so you guys can see. So um, wait, now I cannot. Okay, so Jordan currently an assistant professor um, in the University of Texas Marine Science Institute. Um, she got her uh, bachelor in the um, Siwani, the University of South Siwani, Tennessee, and then PhD in the marine biology in James Cook uh, University, Nashville, uh, Queensland, Australia, and then a uh, postdoctoral fellow in um, molecular ecology, a uh, national Museum of Natural History, Smithsonian Institute, um, Washington, DC. That's uh, where I met her. And then uh, also the postdoctoral before um, she's appointed into the assistant professor. Uh, she's actually the postdoctoral fellow in the University of Paris, uh, the cryo uh, project, University of Virginia. Uh, and then there's also a list of selected publications. Jordan uh, working a lot with the molecular ecology micro microbiome, if I'm not mistaken. And then uh, she's actually an artist uh, doing a sketch on the cryptobantic fish. So, um, and uh, if you're interested, Jordan also has a, a page on her a laboratory in the uh, University of Texas. And um, since I've been working with her, I know uh, she's a very amazing people, a person, amazing researchers as well. Um, that's a little bit about Jordan. I don't want to mention a lot because I want to hear uh, the presentation. So I will stop here and Dr. Jordan Casey, time is yours. Thank you for the very kind introductions. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen and make sure everything is working. Can you see my presentation okay? Yes, it's perfect. Excellent. All right, well, today I'll tell you about a little bit about my research. Um, we've already talked about the title, so we'll just move on from there. So I'm based at the Marine Science Institute, which is a satellite campus of the University of Texas at Austin. Um, it's located in Port Aransas, which is a teeny tiny town um, in South Southern Texas on the Gulf of Mexico. But I conduct most of my research on tropical coral reefs. Um, given my location in Texas, I'm starting to focus more on Caribbean reefs just because it's a little bit easier to get there. But today I'll tell you about some research I've conducted in Indonesia and in French Polynesia over the past couple of years. So let's get started. Um, the ocean makes up over 90% of habitable space on our planet, and it hosts an incredible amount of biodiversity. 
And in the ocean, the bulk of biodiversity exists on coral reefs. So does anyone have any estimate of how many species exist on coral reefs? Can anyone take a guess? No one just raise a hand and guess. Anyone? Could be thousands, right? So my guess would be a couple of hundred thousand. You're you're pretty close. So it's been estimated that coral reefs are home to 830,000 species worldwide. And given this complexity, um, biodiversity on coral reefs is often very poorly defined and the majority of species actually remain undescribed. Well, how can there be so much undescribed biodiversity on coral reefs? Well, the majority of species on coral reefs are actually extremely cryptic. So this tiny crab here is just on the tip of my finger. So it's itty bitty, very tiny. And this camouflaged triple fin, which is a type of fish, if you can even find it in that photo, um, you can barely even see when you're underwater. And that's just about three centimeters long. And this little spaghetti eel, which is the long thing on the bottom of the page, it's completely transparent and it spends its entire life hidden under the sand. So you'll never see it if you go swimming around on a coral reef. So inspired by some of the lingering unknowns in marine systems, my work is really centered around two basic questions. Uh, what species are present on coral reefs and how do they interact with each other? So first to address what species are present, um, marine researchers have developed a number of different collection and monitoring techniques, such as autonomous reef monitoring structures, better known as ARMS, which I'm sure if you're in a class with Gita that she has told you about ARMS before, so these should be familiar to you. But I'll give you a brief reminder about how they work. So ARMS are standardized collection devices that are really designed to mimic the structural complexity of a coral reef. They consist of nine stacked PVC plates mounted on a base plate and alternating layers have crossed PVC bars, which function to create little crevices where benthic organisms can hide. And this is just a small sampling of some of the cryptic organisms that I've collected using arms in Indonesia, Costa Rica, and French Polynesia. And the majority of these critters are less than three centimeters long and they're often overlooked on coral reefs, although they probably play a pretty big role in marine food webs. And that brings me to my second question. Oops. Oops, sorry, I think my slides are skipping a little bit. Here we go. And that brings me to my second question. Um, how do all of these species inter? Correct. Um, so given the vast biodiverse coral reefs, researchers sometimes take shortcuts in how they answer this question. For example, when examining trophic interactions, we tend to lump uh, fishes into trophic categories that are quite broad based on expert opinion. And I don't feel too bad criticizing this particular study because it's my own work. And as you see, I've used really broad categorizations for trophic groups. Uh, for example, um, I use the group called mobile herbivores. But does a title like mobile herbivores really adequately define a trophic group, what all of it, the, those fishes are eating? Uh, well, we know that, for example, species within surgeon fishes have distinct functions on coral reefs. Some eat algae, while others eat detritus, which is the sponge on the bottom of a reef. So these categories can sometimes be helpful, but they really are often just not good enough. In fact, the experts can't even agree on what categories should be used for which fishes. So I recently examined how experts define trophic gills across the coral reef literature. And I found that the experts often disagree on trophic assignments for the same species. So across the x-axis, uh, H stands for herbivores, I stands for invertivores, 
O for omnivores, P for piscivores, and PK for planktivores. And you can see that there's a high level of agreement for all of the herbivores, but there's less than 70% agreement on the assignment of species to the omnivore guild. So even when we use really broad categories, there's still a high level of disagreement in how we think they're behaving on coral reefs. So I wanted to know what trophic groups look like when we only look at the empirical data. So I synthesized data from community-wide visual gut content analysis of tropical coral reefs, which resulted in the trophic information from 14,000 individuals belonging to 615 reef fish species across all ocean basins uh, spread out from Madagascar, Okinawa, the Marshall Islands, Hawaii, and the West Indies. And after collating the prey items into 38 different categories, which are shown around this plot here, I used network analysis to cluster the resulting global food web into distinct trophic guilds. And that resulted in the assignment of eight trophic guilds, which are listed under the pie charts. Um, on the right. And here HMD uh, represents the herbivores, microvores, and detritivores, which were grouped together. And each pie chart shows the relative proportion of fish families within each trophic guild. And finally, I employed a Bayesian phylogenetic model to predict trophic guilds based on phylogeny and maximum body size. So the probability of trophic guild assignments for each species is visualized with these color scales on the right, with the darker the color indicating the higher the probability of an assignment to that trophic guild. So the model, uh, it achieved a misclassification error of less than 5%, which really indicates that my approach is both quantitative and reproducible. Um, which can even be updated if we get more information about what fishes are eating. So now, even though I was excited that we could make the assignment of trophic gills quantifiable and reproducible, they still are after all quite broad. And to put this into perspective, if you consider typical Southern cuisine in the United States, it tends to be rather meat heavy, it usually is made up of a lot of fried chicken and beef brisket. So you might assume that all Southerners in the US are carnivores. Uh, oftentimes even the vegetables that we eat here are served with meat in it, which is pretty crazy. But this isn't strictly true. For example, I was born in South Carolina and I currently live in Texas, but I'm a vegetarian. So uh, dietary patterns aren't always as they seem. So rather than relying on broad trophic categorizations, I'm a proponent of really taking a closer look at diversity with a molecular approach. And most notably, I heavily integrate uh, DNA metabarcoding in my work, which is the mass amplification of DNA barcodes from samples containing a multitude of eukaryotes. And to do this, you take an environmental sample such as a water or a sediment sample, and you use next generation sequencing to put taxonomic IDs on sequences. And in this way, I'm able to describe biodiversity and pinpoint cryptic species interactions, often with really high taxonomic resolution. And with that said, I want to give you an overview of the main things I'll be talking about today. So my work can be separated into two main components. Um, first is the methodological validation of molecular approaches to describe biodiversity patterns. And the second is, uh, the, second is the uh, application of molecular tools. And today I'm gonna tell you about two aspects of each of these components. And we're gonna go through each one. So first starting with quantifying taxonomic biases of unifrosal markers. And this is some work I did with DITA. So even though metabarcoding provides a lot of detail about biodiversity, it comes with various biases. 
So one of the greatest sources of bias in med barcoding data is associated with primer choice. And in studies that focus on eukaryotic biodiversity, such as ARMS, the autonomous reef monitoring structures, two commonly targeted genes are the mitochondrial cytochrome C, oxidase subunit one, or CO1 as we like to call it, and the 18S ribosomal RNA uh, gene regions. And these two gene regions are considered universal markers across a broad range of eukaryotic taxa. However, the 18S gene is most or is more commonly selected and most marker performance comparisons have been completed for zooplankton communities actually in temperate zones, not on coral reefs. So at, no, at, at the present, really no study has systematically quantified the performance of these two universal markers in the center of marine biodiversity, the coral triangle, not too far from where you are. And, and that brings me to the main question of this study. Uh, what are the biases in CO1 and 18S universal markers across marine eukaryotic assemblages? So to assess this question, arms were deployed in Bali, Indonesia at two different sites. And at one site, arms were deployed across two separate years. So after deploying the arms and letting them marinate underwater for two years, uh, they were collected. And to assess the biodiversity that colonized these structures, each PVC plate was photographed to document the sessile communities on them. Then all the organisms were filtered into different size fractions. And each fraction was put into a blender and we made one well-blended meta sample, which is like a smoothie. And it looks and it smells quite horrible and it nicely reinforces my vegetarianism. Uh, I then conducted CO1 and 18S meta barcoding on these homogenized smoothie samples. And here's what I found. So these are rare fraction curves for each arms unit that shows basically the sampling effort according to the total number of sequences along the x-axis and the operational taxonomic unit richness, which are abbreviated as OTUs on the y-axis. So OTUs are distinct taxonomic entities. And here for the ease of interpretation, you can kind of think of them like distinct species. So you can see that the sampling did not quite reach saturation for either marker, which isn't overly surprising, it often does not, but the total number of OTUs was similar between the two markers, between CO1 and 18S. So this is just a little summary of what we found. And while the CO1 and 18S markers recovered similar numbers of sequences, and operational taxonomic units, there were some notable differences. So in the CO1 data set, 49.4% of the OTUs were unidentified to taxonomic level as compared to 0.8% of the 18S data set. In addition, there was a higher phylum level biodiversity uh, represented in the 18S data set which recovered 51 phyla as compared to 38 phyla in the CO1 data set. I then performed an ordination analysis for the CO1 and 18S markers to show the association of arms, size fractions, and different spatiotemporal variables. And here, uh, CO1 is on the left side of the plot and 18S is on the right. And as you can see, these two plots look almost identical. So for each plot, each shaded triangle represents a particular arms unit, while the dotted polygons represent a certain size fraction among the arms. So I detected some pretty clear clustering among the individual arms and also fine scale clustering among the different size fractions across both uh, the sites and the years that these arms were deployed. Um, and this was consistent across both of the markers, the CO1 and 18S. So up until now, the two markers performed quite similarly for a total number of sequences 
uh, the number of species detected and clustering patterns related to taxonomic units. I then ran uh, Bayesian mixed models to analyze the taxonomic biases of the CO1 versus the 18S marker across the 20 co-occurring phyla that um, were in both data sets. So here, uh, the relative abundance is along the x-axis and the, and the uh, pulled arms from each site and year are along the y-axis. And each panel here represents a different phyla. And the most notable differences emerge in the predicted relative abundances of amoebozoa, ascomycota, bryozoa, chlorophyta, uh, chordata, interpracta, and nematoda. Um, but five of these groups were really rare, and um, you probably don't even know what they mean. <laughs> uh, like interpracta, no one, no one even thinks about interpracta very often. So the, I want you to focus on two groups, and that's the bryozoa and chordata, which are highlighted in yellow. So bryozoa has a markedly higher predicted relative abundance uh, in the CO1 data set. And uh, Chordata had a, a higher relative predicted abundance in the 18S data set. But across most phyla, the projections largely overlapped. And that indicates that the primers have similar relative abundances um, estimates um, for both of these groups. Now, comparing the performance of these markers isn't really informative unless you have a baseline to work with. So I used a semi-automated platform, which was called CoralNet, to annotate the images of arms plates. So with the help of CoralNet, I quantified the benthic organisms uh, present at 225 points on each arms plate. And then I compared this visual assessment to the CO1 and the 18S marker performance for seven co-occurring phyla. So again, using Bayesian mixed modeling approach um, to look at the differences, I found some striking results. And here the relative abundance again is along the x-axis and each of the different panels is a different phylum. And interestingly, the CO1 marker predicts similar relative abundances as the annotated orange plates for chordata, which in this case are not humans, they are tunicates, not surprising, um, and bryozoa. So while the 18S marker um, actually overestimates chordates and underestimates bryozoans, and for chlorophyta, so those are your green algae, the CO1 and 18S markers both uh, predict markedly lower relative abundances than the annotated arm plates. Um, but this phylum was comparatively uh, a lowly represented one across the data sets, so it's not quite as important. So overall, the CO1 marker seems to perform better for dominant sessile organisms. So to summarize what we found, uh, I found that CO1 and 18S predictions are markedly similar in general diversity patterns, but 18S metabar coding identified 25% more phyla and resulted in vastly higher identified OTUs than CO1 metabar coding. Thus, uh, the 18S metabar coding may provide uh, more complete uh, taxonomic resolution for very cryptic organisms that often go overlooked. However, CO1 did more faithfully uh, recover diversity patterns of sessile organisms on arms plates, and that's supported by the visual image analysis. So altogether, universal markers recover distinct patterns of uh, eukaryotes in a hyperdiverse coral reef environment. And ideal marker choice is really dependent on the study system, your research question, and the taxonomic resolution that you need. And to bridge these limitations, I would recommend taking a multi-marker approach. So using um, a combination of different markers when conducting DNA metabar coding. Now, despite these biases um, that we did identify, uh, these results did give me hope that the utilization of DNA metabar coding uh, could shed light on coral reef trophic interactions in good detail. 
And that brings me to the next topic, reconstructing food webs with gut content metabarcoding. So molecular methods aside, um, some researchers have attempted to piece together holistic food webs, which have defined trophic gut interactions, really just based on three methods, a visual gut content analysis, a stable isotope analysis, and behavioral observations. This is obviously been very greatly informative and very helpful in moving the field forward. But I would argue that we do have better methods available to us, and mostly fish gut content metabarcoding. Now, DNA metabarcoding utilized to consider fish gut content before. However, it's only been done on a really small scale. Uh, in one study we recently published, uh, I used metabarcoding to examine the diets of two sets of cryptobenthic fishes, so tiny little fishes in Belize. And metabarcoding is particularly useful for these itty bitty fishes because getting a handle on what these fishes eat is nearly impossible from visual examination. You can imagine dissecting a three centimeter fish and trying to see what it ate inside. So here is a network of each fish species and the crustacean items that they consumed because they mostly consume arthropods. And this gives us some nice detail on how many unique versus overlapping um, prey items that they ingest. So uh, with the uh, blue and green clouds, they represent the unique prey items and the gray clouds represent the shared prey items. So I was able to detect prey partitioning across the four species, which probably would not have been possible without using gut content metabarcoding. However, fish communities on coral reefs are much more complex than uh, two, two pairs of congeneric uh, cryptobenthic fishes. So can we employ this technique across a broad range of coral reef fishes? And do we have sufficient data in DNA barcoding databases to put taxonomic labels on the prey items. In my case, I was lucky because French Polynesia, where I was doing um, this next study, um, it, it does have the Morea Biocode project. So this initiative is the result of a massive effort to collect and sequence DNA barcodes for all metazoans around Morea. So we're now able to reliably conduct uh, metabarcoding of metazoan prey in Morea. And that brings me to the questions that I sought to answer through this study. Can we employ fish gut content metabarcoding across a highly diverse food web? And are patterns of fine scale niche partitioning upheld across a broad range of coral reef fishes? So like I said, this was take, this took place in Morea, French Polynesia, which is in the middle of the ocean, um, very far from any continents. And fish collections were conducted in two ways. We collected big fishes with spear fishing. And, uh, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. For this study, we only did spear fishing. Um, so I decided to work with 22 species across eight families, uh, including damsel fishes, butterfly fishes, brasses, sugar fishes, uh, just one goby, one sweeper, two squirrel fishes, and one cardinal fish. And now this may appear to be a really random bunch of species, but I primarily uh, targeted these species because they do target a wide range of invertebrate prey items. And I wanted to focus on invertebrate feeders because I targeted the CO1 gene region, which is ideal for sequencing invertebrates. So how does that work? So you first dissect out the gut of the fish, and then you homogenize all of the gut contents, usually with a mortar and pestle. And then you conduct a DNA extraction and begin Amplicon library which Dita can tell you more about later. I won't go into that too much today. Uh, the sample is then sequenced using a MySeq, and then I use bioinformatics pipelines to assemble and align the sequences. 
And lastly, the sequences are defined as operational taxonomic units and assigned taxonomy. So first, let's look at dietary partitioning of fish species. So this is an ordination plot where each polygon represents the dietary breadth of one of the 22 fish species. And the colors are um, aligned with the taxonomic family of the fishes. So you can see from the separation of these polygons that some species show a really high degree of dietary separation. However, particularly for the wrasses, which are the blue polygons, you can see some overlap and some clustering of these polygons. Now this shows the exact same ordination plot, but now the colors represent the trophic groups. And all these trophic groups were taken from fish base, which is one of the most commonly used databases for trophic group assignment in marine fishes. And here you can see really minimal clustering. Uh, for example, all planktivores, which are the yellow polygons, are unique. And it's really difficult to tease out any trends. So to quantify uh, the explanatory power of taxonomic family and trophic group, I use PERMANOVAS and the variance partitioning method across four different metrics that are used to convert uh, sequence reads to dietary data, including um, relative read abundance, which is often reported, and three different occurrence metrics. Um, so across all of these metrics, no matter how you convert the data and look at it, uh, both taxonomic family and trophic group were relatively weak predictors of species diets, but taxonomic family is consistently better across um, all of these different types of data than trophic group. I also used a convex um, or individual based convex hall method to calculate uh, two-dimensional niche space occupation for each species. And this is directly taken from the ordination results. So the plot on the right side shows the fish species along the x-axis and the percent niche area occupied for each species relative to total available niche space along um, the y-axis. So each color represents a different fish family. And it's pretty clear that species dietary breadth is not driven by taxonomic family. So moving on to trophic network mapping. So this very complicated, but I think pretty at least uh, visualization is actually really simplified by partite trophic network. And it includes 233 OTUs that had a 1% or greater relative of abundance uh, for each of the fish species. So fish species are listed across the top and the prey items are across the bottom and they're grouped by phyla, uh, which is also coded by the different colors. And each of the little squares indicates a distinct class, except for arthropods um, where I use super family because there are just so many different groups of arthropods. So overall, invertebrate prey items are extremely diverse but a large proportion of prey items are in the phylum arthropoda. So they really like eating crustaceans and uh, different arthropods. So overall, my results indicate that taxonomic group uh, perform, outperforms um, or performs really substantially better than trophic group to predict fish diet. In addition, um, I reconstructed a complex trophic network that really does showcase niche partitioning among species that are commonly considered to occupy the same trophic groups. So all in all, um, the, of the 4,341 prey items identified, 75% were specific to a particular fish individual, which really underlines the importance of qualifying species trophic niches beyond broad categories. These fishes are very specialized. However, we do have to keep in mind potential caveats associated with DNA metabarcoding. For instance, 
amplification bias or the tendency uh, for certain sequences to preferentially amplify with a selected primer. And that can really skew our perception of fish diet. Um, you're also limited by uh, the availability of DNA barcode data. We were fortunate to have the Mario Biocode database, so it wasn't too much of a problem for us. Um, it also may be difficult to decipher whether sequences are from adults or from eggs. Uh, for example, a goatfish was the most common prey item in our data set. However, the species that fed on the goatfish were actually smaller than an adult goatfish. So how is that possible? Well, it's quite likely that they were feeding on the eggs of a goatfish and not adult goatfishes. Um, and that probably happened during a stochastic spawning event. And stochastic spawning events may skew dietary information because the fish just gobble up a bunch of eggs and um, their whole bellies are full of one thing just because something was um, producing eggs at that time. Um, also, uh, lab processing and subsequent, subsequent bioinformatics are really time intensive. So um, we know that very well from the, the weeks and months we spend in the lab. So you have to keep in mind how long this takes to do. And lastly, the costs can be quite high. So you have to make sure you get some grants and are prepared for high costs. But I, I am hopeful that sequencing technology is improving and becoming cheaper over time. So I hope it'll be more accessible to more scientists in the near future. So overall, I was able to conclude that CO1 metabarcoding provides incredible resolution and it wouldn't have been able to achieve this type of hoop up reconstruction without a molecular toolbox. And this really demonstrates the high potential of fish gut content metabar coding for large scale food web reconstruction. Now, having gotten some promising uh, method validation results from DNA metabar coding, I've begun to apply this molecular tool to really tease apart trophic interactions in the context of global change. Uh, so that brings me to my next goal, which is to understand the multifaceted impact of coral bleaching on trophic interactions. So scientists generally agree that the biggest threat to coral reefs is climate change. Uh, with steadily increasing global temperatures, we are more and more frequently witnessing coral bleaching in tropical reef systems. Um, have any of y'all um, observed a bleaching event or seen a bleaching coral before? It's pretty sad to watch. Um, so let's briefly uh, just review how bleaching works in, in a coral reef system. So reef systems like the Great Barrier Reef are made up of thousands of coral reefs, uh, which are then made up of coral colonies which are then made up of individual polyps. So it's a very meta system. Um, so each coral animal is known as a polyp. And most of these polyps live in groups of hundreds to thousands of genetically identical polyps. So the Great Barrier Reef, the biggest reef in the world, is effectively made up of billions of tiny coral polyps. And tiny microalgae live inside each coral polyp polyp called zooxanthellae, which give corals their really pretty colors of blues and purples and oranges. Um, zooxanthellae are autotrophs, which they produce energy from the sun, and coral polyps also feed on the passing plankton in the water column. So corals are mixtotrophic, meaning that they get nutrients in two different ways, autotrophy via their microalgae and heterotrophy via capturing plankton. But when a coral gets really uh, hot and stressed out due to these continuous high temperatures um, that we're frequently seeing, unfortunately, it spits out the zooxanthellae, those microalgae. So on the right, you can see a photo of a bleached coral that has ejected its zooxanthellae. And unfortunately, if it remains hot for a really long period of time, um, it's usually about a week or maybe a little bit longer, the coral cannot survive without the microalgae. So eventually turf 
and macroalgae grow on the surface of the coral and the coral dies. Now in my first uh, two years of working in Marea, French Polynesia, the reefs were really healthy and there was really high coral cover. It's some of the highest coral cover I've actually ever seen. Um, unfortunately, a mass bleaching event uh, did occur in April and May of 2019 and the reefs transitioned to a predominantly algae covered state by the end of 2019 and early 2020. Now, this is obviously horrible for coral reefs and it didn't make us happy, but it also does provide a scientific opportunity uh, to study how coral feeding fishes respond to these big changes on coral reefs. Um, because when it comes to it, while we've studied coral bleaching and how that works a lot, Lot, we know relatively little about the responses of fishes to this phenomenon, um, although it is abundantly clear that fishes do rely on corals for both food and for habitat, depending on what species you're thinking about. And perhaps the most notorious coral feeding fishes on coral reefs are butterfly fishes in the family Ketodontidae. So many species in this family are considered obligate corallivores, which means they only feed on corals. This is their only chance um, of living and, and surviving. And obligate corallivores, surprisingly, find bleached corals delicious in the short term um, because bleached corals aren't quite yet dead. So under really high temperatures, corals not only spit out their zoolite, also eat a lot of proteins, which are really nutritional for these species. So the obligate corallivores may actually benefit from coral bleaching in the short term and prefer taking bites out of bleached corals over healthy corals, which some people find surprising. But coral bleaching is not all happiness in the long term because eventually um, they may all die and become covered in algae. So even though they are temporarily able to consume high level of nutrients during a bleaching event, uh, the corals are going to die and then they have nothing left to eat. So we wanted to see whether we could detect the nutritional impact of bleaching on butterfly fish communities. So that brings me to my next question. Uh, how does bleaching impact coral feeding fishes and nutrient fluxes on coral reefs? This, way, uh, this work once again took place in Morea, back in the middle of the ocean. Um, and to conduct this study, I first examined coral and butterfly fish communities before, during, and after the bleaching event. And here are some simplified results from those surveys. So the top panel contains our survey results from five time points from 2003 to 2020, yeah, 2020. And on the bottom panel shows general long-term trends um, from a long-term monitoring project around Morea. And I've included that because we do have such big gaps and when we collected our data, so I wanted to fill in those gaps. Um, so here, year is along the x-axis and the percent of healthy hard coral cover is um, along the y-axis um, and butterfly fish is also along the y-axis. So corals are in red and your butterfly fishes are in blue. So overall coral cover declined due to the coral bleaching event with the total coral cover going from 50% in 2018 to 30% in 2019. Then the coral slightly recovered increasing to 40% in 2020. Um, so some of those corals must have been able to regain their zoos and ballet and live again. So that's good news, at least some of them were. Um, butterfly fish communities showed a slightly different pattern uh, with the total number of butterfly fishes declining from 2018 to 2019 and also declining from 2019 to 2020. So how did that impact their nutrition? So to find this out, I examined two dominant obligate corallivores, 
which are uh, ketidon ornatissimus, which is the one with the orange stripes on the left, and ketidon reticulatus, which is the gray dotted fish on the right. I then conducted uh, feeding behavior observations, uh, gut content metabar coding, and uh, an analysis of dietary nutrient content. And here, uh, dietary nutrient content basically consists of unwinding butterfly fish intestines and then taking out samples of the gut contents in the stomach, uh, which is the pink thing in the top right corner of that, of that photo. And right before the anus, just before it excretes um, the food item. So it's essentially feces. Um, these samples were analyzed for carbon and nitrogen levels, which we can then use to determine how much nutrients a fish absorbs along its digestive tract, which is really interesting. Um, I conducted these methods in 2018, 2019, and 2020. But there's one piece of important information I haven't given you yet. And it's that in 2020, which was intended to be our um, sampling after a bleaching event, there was actually um, a little mini bleaching event that happened where 10% of the corals bleached again, very unexpected. Um, now this is much lower than the 2019 bleaching event when 50% of the corals bleached, but it's still important to keep that in mind. Okay, let's move on to the results. Okay, to interpret the behavioral observations, I ran selectivity models for ketodon ornatissimus on the left and ketodon um, reticulatus on the right. And for these models, I only have data from 2019 and 2020. Uh, so each row of the panels includes different coral bleaching status with unbleached corals at the top row, then you have your bleached corals. And then at the bottom are the partially dead corals, which refers to the bleached corals that have died and been overgrown by algae. So butterfly fish selectivity is along the Y axis and the coral category is along the X axis. And coral categories include Pasolabra, which is actually the most abundant coral genus around Morea and uh, parietes, which is the second most abundant genus, and um, other, and that combines all the other uh, coral genera around Morea French Polynesia. And actually, there aren't many others. It's, it's a very simple system there. So I found that Ketodon ornatissimus and Reticulatus both favored unbleached corals in 2019, but selected bleach corals in 2020, which is really interesting. Uh, so why do these obligate coralivores like bleach corals in 2020, but not 19? Well, I think it's related to the timing of the bleaching. So in 2019, we conducted these behavioral observations about two weeks after the coral bleaching began. But in 2020, we conducted these observations exactly when the bleaching started. So the butterfly fish must have been really attracted to the lipids and proteins um, being excreted, particularly by the newly bleached corals in 2020. Now, these are two ordination plots, uh, which show the results of the fish gut content metabar coding uh, results. And um, the ornatissimus is on your left and reticulatus is on the right. And here, color corresponds with the year. So again, 2018 before the bleach, 2019 during it, in 2020 after slash during a mini bleaching event. Um, and you can see that Ornithesimus slightly diversifies its diet from 2018 to 2020, and it broadens its diet target to arthropods. Um, and that may be perhaps due to the coral decline. So it's finding some minor other things to add to its diet. Conversely, reticulatus uh, shifts its diet from parietes um, in 2018 to 2020, which is the coral genus that experienced slightly less bleaching during the coral bleaching event. So we see some slight dietary shifts from 2018 to 2020, but there were really no drastic changes in what they were eating. 
And if you take a closer look at the dominant coral genera and the diets of Ornithisinus and Reticulatus, it becomes clear that there aren't many differences when comparing the broad main categories of their diets um, from 2018 to 2020. So these are the results of another Bayesian mixed model. And again, color corresponds to the year. Uh, the top three panels correspond to dietary preferences of Ornithisimus, and the bottom three panels correspond to Reticulatus. And the x-axis shows the relative abundance of each dietary item. And each panel corresponds to uh, one of those coral genera, including the three dominant groups, Pasolopra, Parietes, and the other category with all other coral genera. So across all coral groups, the predictions are not largely overlapped. You don't see those, those density plots overlapping each other. And that means that there's really no notable dietary differences in these groups among the three years. Now here are some results from the dietary nutrient content and assimilation from the stomach. Um, again, that little dot up in pink uh, to the hindgut. And here, year is indicated by color once again, and the percent carbon, um, which is one nutrient we examined, is on the y-axis of the top two panels, and the percent nitrogen is along the y-axis on the bottom two panels. So along the x-axis, you can see the region sampled, including the stomach, which is indicated by diet, and the hindgut, which is indicated by feces. And you can see that carbon and nitrogen content um, in the stomachs of both of these fishes is slightly higher during the bleaching event in 2019. However, the excreted nutrient content is approximately the same uh, before and during the bleaching content. So it seems that they actually obtained more nutrients and absorbed more nutrients along their intestinal tract during 2019 as opposed to 2018 and 2020. So this story is getting really confusing, I bet. There's a lot going on here. Um, so despite feeding on mostly healthy corals, these butterfly fishes obtained higher levels of carbon and nitrogen during the mass bleaching in 2019. So what did I pull from all of this information? It's a lot of different data to put together and think about. Overall, I found no clear negative impact of bleaching on the, um, sorry, I definitely found a clear impact of, of uh, bleaching on the abundance of obligate corallivores, but there was a slightly lagged effect from the coral mortality. It takes two years to see the impact of bleaching really on these fishes. I also found that coral bleaching is a complex nutritional event. So corallivores preferred bleached corals during early bleach stages in 2020, but during the mass bleaching event in 2019, um, that was not the case. So after only two weeks, corallivores prefer unbleached corals. Nonetheless, the bleaching event did provide a slight increase in nitrogen and carbon content, which indicates that the healthy corals during a bleaching event may also be stressed and emitting extra amounts of lipids and proteins. So that may cause that um, fish preference for healthy corals during a bleaching event. Because even though we don't see that they're being bleached and they don't look bleached, they're really stressed out. So it goes to show um, that we need to think about things that aren't just detectable by human observation. We need to think about the nutrient content of these corals. Um, so all in all, all this shows that it's really useful to couple molecular techniques with other met methods like nutrient content of carbon and nitrogen in some of these food items um, so that you can examine not only what things the fish is consuming, but also the nutrients that it's actually obtaining from that meal. Um, in the future, we do need to pay closer attention to coral nutrient content, especially from healthy corals um, during a mass bleaching. To, to really ground truth whether they are emitting a lot of lipids and proteins as well as some of these bleached corals that we know do this. So other than being some of the prettiest fishes on coral reefs, 
why should we care about butterfly fishes or quarry fishes in general? Well, they're part of a much bigger food web. And if enough nodes of a food web are eliminated, the whole network could very well collapse. So what is the tipping point of a coral reef food web? And that brings me to the last element that I'll present today of my ongoing research, uh, the resilience of food webs under climate change. So far, we've established that uh, food web reconstruction is definitely feasible with DNA metabarcoding. I hope I convinced you of that. Um, but this has never been conducted across an entire food web. Uh, likewise, it's really well accepted that food web structure is essential to understand nutrient uh, fluxes on coral reefs, what fishes are eating and what they're pooping out and what that means for how coral reefs move around nutrients. But we have a very limited knowledge of how nutrient fluxes shift under global change uh, scenarios. So that brings me to my final question. Uh, what is the trajectory of coral reef food webs and nutrient fluxes under climate change scenarios? So to address this question, I drastically expanded my fish sampling around Morea to include 127 sampling sites across all different reef habitats. Um, and that includes the sheltered lagoon all the way to the reef slope. And in addition to sampling across this, these different environments, samples were collected over the course of three years and distributed across three or six months uh, to avoid any seasonal biases that may occur, for instance, in the rainy season versus the dry season. Another notable element of my fish collections in this time, uh, I did not only collect really big fishes with spearfishing, I also included cryptobenthic fishes, which are generally all less than five centimeters. Um, so given their tiny size and their cryptic nature on coral reefs. The studies on their diets are quite rare. Um, although some recent research that we've been working on has highlighted their important role in food web dynamics. So these fishes are really short-lived. Some of them, like uh, certain species of gobies, especially in the genus Eviota, they only live for 60 days. Imagine your whole life only being two months long. And they can kind of be seen as the peanuts of a coral reef. They're, they're a nice nutritious snack for the bigger fishes. So to make all of these collections possible, I worked with a really great team uh, to collect as much information as possible on these fishes. So we weren't just um, collecting all the time. It was a lot of lab work, which you can see um, some late nights in the lab dissecting fishes. Um, and in addition to collecting data on gut content metabarcoding, I also collected samples for stable isotope analysis uh, to complement the metabarcoding results. So while metabarcoding provides a great short-term snapshot of what a fish eats, uh, stable isotope analysis provides information on a fish's long-term trophic level. And I decided to use three markers to examine fish diet, including 18S, CO1, and 23S. So as I touched on previously, uh, 18S is a great marker across most organisms, uh, but the taxonomic resolution can be quite poor. Conversely, the CO1 marker works really well across most metazoans on coral reefs but it does not amplify well for some algae. And 23S is a good primer for most algae. So with the combination of these three primers um, or these three markers, I, I hope to paint the most complete picture of fish diet possible um, with 18S serving as a broad umbrella taxa across um, all taxonomic groups, CO1 providing detailed taxonomic information for metazoans, and 23S providing pretty good resolution for algae. 
and ultimately um, ended up reconstructing, um, as far as I know, what is the highest resolution food web ever assembled for a coral reef ecosystem. So we collected 1,974 individuals across 271 species and 51 families um, after three very long years. <laughs> and then we used CO1 and 23S markers. And um, these samples have yielded over 50,000 distinct prey items. So that's a massive food web and a lot of different trophic connections happening. Oops, that was premature, sorry. Uh, so with this high resolution food web, um, I was interested in examining whether fishes are dietary specialists or whether they overlap in prey consumption and what they're eating. So, so here's an example of how I analyzed this data. So first I looked at interest specific niche partitioning, which is partitioning among individuals of the same species. And then I looked at inter-specific partitioning, which is partitioning among the different species. So I first placed each individual in multi-dimensional ordination space. And then to describe the niche of an individual or a species, I calculated the total ellipsoid volume, uh, volumes, uh, which are represented by these gray polygons. And finally, I calculated the overlap between uh, individuals or species pairs. So on the left, you can see an example of niche overlap among individuals of the same species. And on the right, you can see niche partitioning species. So first looking at intraspecific partitioning, um, intraspecific overlap is along the x-axis and prey taxonomic rank is along the y-axis. So these are density plots and they represent the likelihood of niche overlap in the observed data compared to a null model. Um, so when interspecific overlap is to the right of that dotted line, which is positioned at zero, there is more overlap than expected by chance. And regardless of prey taxonomic rank, whether you're looking at phylum to species, there is more niche overlap among individuals of the same species than you would expect by chance. And this is not surprising. Um, it does indicate that we've done an adequate job at sampling enough individuals to represent the overall diet of a species. Now moving on to interspecific niche partitioning. So these are similar density plots that represent the likelihood of niche overlap um, in the observed data compared to a null model. And even when you're looking across 271 species, we continue to see really high rates of niche partitioning. So with higher prey taxonomic resolution, there is a higher chance of overlap. Again, this is not surprising, um, but notably, even when prey is only defined to the level of order, family, or genus, there is less overlap than expected by chance. And here I'd like you to really focus in on the yellow density plot, which is on the bottom and indicates um, predicted overlap by species because metabarcoding does often allow you to define prey items all the way down to the species level. So it's quite reasonable that we'd be looking at this level. And the low likelihood of overlap indicates that we are severely underestimating specialization in reef fish species. These fishes have very specialized diets. And we see a very similar pattern when we look at stable isotope data. So I took a similar approach as I did with the metabarcoding, but I haven't finished processing all these samples yet. So this is not the complete data set, but I calculated overlap between species pairs uh, for the stable isotope data by calculating delta C versus delta M, which is a common approach in stable isotope analysis. And here, the zero means that there's no overlap, while one means that there is 100% overlap between species niches. 
So overall, what this means is that for 45% of species, the probability of overlapping niche space is 0%. So that's pretty specialized. Um, I'm also starting to run some simulations on the metabarcoding data set to examine how consumer loss disrupts trophic flow across the marine food web. So by simulating species loss, I can quantify the cumulative loss of trophic pathways and make inferences about the resilience of food webs under climate change scenarios. Um, but those results aren't quite ready yet. So I'll leave that for later. So even across 271 species, I've found that quarry fishes exhibit fine scale niche partitioning, which is consistent across both the DNA metabarcoding and the stable isotope data. So the concept of functional redundancy is really pervasive um, in hyperdiverse ecosystems. And that basically means that multiple species may fill the same ecological role. But here we show that's really not the case on coral reefs. So each species represents a unique trophic pathway eating a distinct diet, and um, they may have a critical function on the overarching food web. So to tie it all together, um, even though the ocean represents the most expansive habitat on the planet, um, I think we can harness the power of really the tiny building blocks of life DNA to better understand the processes that underpinned entire marine ecosystems. So with that, I'll say thank you to the many, many collaborators that have helped me and collaborated with me on these projects. I definitely could not do this work without the work of many, many others. And that's the beauty of science, I think. Um, also all the organizations that supported me in the US and Europe and French Polynesia and Indonesia and um, now in Texas. So um, thanks for listening and um, following along early in the morning with me. Thank you so much, Jordan. Um, presentation is really impressive. It's really hard to make a resume because there's a lot of things happen over there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, but it's really interesting because um, I just want to make some note for uh, my student, especially that as a biologist, it doesn't mean that you only do the research. You can be a statistician, you can be an artist, you can be a photographer, you can see all that beauty in the presentation that's been done by a biologist. So it's a lot of things to explore. Um, it doesn't mean that you have a, to get it grade A every day, but you can, you know, doing something different uh, with your data. And the other thing is, as a biologist, the important thing is first you can, you have to identify the problems and then you asking a question and then you find a solution. And along the way, that's the time when you try to find what's the good method to be used and then, um, which one, you know, like there's a lot of other methods out there. So the important thing is you have a problem and you ask a question. So because of that, now I want to invite you to ask a question. Um, so Jordan, I think we'll start with like a try about one, two or three question first, and then mm -hmm. um, we'll continue if there's another one, okay? So I have a, oh, I have three questions in my chat right now, okay. So the first is uh, from uh, Bu Nur Hayati uh, from biology. Uh, the first question is regarding the biodiversity at species level. Is, uh, is it analyzing using CO1 and APNES better than RAPD, uh, gene, uh, RAP gene or ITS? That's a great question. I think it really depends on what organisms you're focusing on. So I've not seen direct comparisons among those four markers, so I can't say concretely, um, but certainly I know certain organisms amplify better with ITS than others. So if you're interested in certain things over others, then maybe, but in other situations, not. Um, 18S and CO1, I think 
tend to be a little bit broader than the other two markers that you mentioned. So if you're trying to get just a big picture across the ocean, um, they might be better options, but it really depends what system you're working in. Okay, uh, the second question. So after that, and then we ask the Nurhayati. For, uh, and maybe I think we need more clarification for this. For isolate metagenome, for metabarcoding, is it need NGS or other type of method? Um, oh, sorry. Should do you want to ask uh, Nurhayati for a clarification or something? So the question is for isolate metagenome for metabarcoding. Is it need uh, NGS or another kind of key, uh, another kind of method? Sorry. So next generation sequencing is the method I've always used for it, but I can't say one hundred percent whether there are other options because there are so many things that are evolving right now. I'm sure people have developed other techniques and, and ways forward with that. So I'm not the definitive authority on that, um, but NGS is a great way to approach that. Okay, great. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, Bunur Hayati, if you still have question or do you want some clarification, uh, please uh, just uh, open the mic or you can just chat uh, with us. Okay. So Bharati said thank you. Um, I know there's a, a new thing about uh, the whole meta genomic and the meta, meta barcoding right now. So uh, there's also uh, there's a lot of questions related to that. One question is quite uh, long. I send you uh, through the chat, Jordan, from Danny. Um, can you help me with read that through? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I will wait, wait, let me. So, um, okay, the question is, uh, what is the data reference that you use for CO1 and APMS, especially for the invertebrate or sessile? Um, and how much cutoff of similarity uh, that you use for the gut content metabolism? That's the first. The second okay. is, um, how much standard do we need to get content sample from each species group? As we know, if we want to compare tropic group for the size of this. So Danny is actually one of our um, researchers, uh, junior researchers at Bionesia, and uh, mm -hmm. he's one of my uh, statistician, my bioinformatician. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, those are very good questions. Um, let me reread the beginning because that's a lot. Um, let's see. What databases uh, that you're using for C1-18S for inferences? So the database that I've been using was the Maria Biocode database. And that's been really great for us because they have um, provided so many barcodes in that database and it has been building up over several decades. Um, and so it's an internal database at the moment. Um, there is a publicly available version of it. Um, I believe it's through the California, I think it's through Berkeley archives. Um, it's cited in my paper though, when it is available. Um, so that's been really useful. Um, also just, I mean, there are so many databases that we supplement that with just online um, that are available to everyone, just going through NCBI and other available databases are, are really useful to also work with. How much cutoff or similarity should we use for gut content metabarcoding? analysis when comparing with reference database. Um, that really depends on which primary you're using. So for CO1, I um, often set the cutoff at about 97% to identify to the genus level. And um, depending on what kind of data I'm looking at, either 85% or 90% for the phylum. Um, Every different marker is different though, just because of the nature of how many base pair changes and the rate of evolution and changing that gene region over time. So um, I think, I mean, 16S, when we look at microbes, it's pretty similar. We, we stick with the 97% or 98% some people use for species level and um, 90 or 85 for phylum. But I think 18S is quite different. For instance, you can set it lower for phylum level classification. And I don't think there's a good concrete threshold to use. Um, that's something you kind of feel out and um, 
can do some analyses on based on rates of identification and you can pinpoint false identifications as well. So that's something you kind of have to ground truth with the system you're working in. So that can be tricky to define, but a lot of the past literature can help define those thresholds. All right, one more question on there. Uh, yeah, if um, two more questions. One, uh, okay. I will translate it after this. So uh, this mm -hmm. is now is from Eric Arasi Rudianto. Um, so the question I just want to read for everybody. Um, I'm wondering if we perform that content DNA meta barcoding uh, on a higher tropic species such as the apex predator. Do we need to get rid of the lower tropic, or do you find the breakout content during the data analysis? The second one is: Can we use this method for understanding parasitic collagen coral reef? And the third one, third now is a three question. Uh, so, is the bleach coral is more digestible compared with the hybrid coral? That's referred to the last. Uh, uh, the, the what is the name the Kappa project? Please. These are great questions, all of them. Really, it's really, really clever. Yeah, people are paying very close attention. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's it's a great observation with higher trophic levels. Um, if they consume, for instance, a snapper, the snapper also has food in its stomach. So we're also going to end up sequencing what's in that snapper's stomach for um, an agobi stomach, for instance. Um, some of that's unavoidable, um, depending on the species you're working with. Um, however, the meta barcoding results, you can look at relative abundances. And in the grand scheme of things, the flesh from that fish is going to take up a lot more space than their gut contents. It's very meta, but the next gut contents of the next fish, um, the prey item. So I think that, unfortunately, yes, that's a false signal because it's um, the prey of a prey. It's secondary consumption, essentially. And, but you end up with that in your data if you sequence it. Um, another approach can be if you know that species is only a piscivore and it's only eating fishes, you just use a primer that only captures other fishes. And generally, when you go down the food web, um, the next fish is probably going to be an algae eater. And maybe you're not going to pick up the algae because the primer you use um, isn't, you know, geared toward algae. So um, sometimes you do end up with secondary consumption. And that's, that's just something in your data set you have to take into account and realize that's a caveat. Um, but uh, sometimes it's not a problem because all the fishes that are inside the second fish's stomach um, Aren't, aren't going to be fish tissue. Um, next one is parasites. Parasites are really tough. Um, I've had a lot of people try to uh, get me to look more into the parasites and the gut contents. Um, I think it's, it's a really interesting and important question. There are whole network papers just based on parasite uh, food web ecology that are fascinating. The problem that we're having at the moment is that it's really hard to barcode parasites because they're full of host tissue of um, the fishes they're parasitizing. So sometimes when you try to sequence a parasite, you end up sequencing the fish that it was parasite parasitizing. Um, so it, it becomes very difficult to get that signal clearly and um, not to just in, end up sequencing an unintentional target. Um, but certainly I think we should fine tune how we take into account parasite ecology. Um, although I think we're gonna have to work on that a little harder because it has been really hard for us um, to, to do so far. So with the bleached corals versus the healthy corals, um, it's not, I don't think necessarily that it's more digestible um, I, I think that the signal that we find is that in, in 2019, for instance, when they were eating the healthy corals, they were getting more nutrients from them because it was the beginning of a stress event. And this is when they are emitting the highest level. This is what we're hypothesizing, the highest level of proteins and lipids. So I think just the um, amount of nutrients that were being 
kind of ejected into the water column from these corals was the highest. Whereas when they were eating the bleached corals in 2020 and the nutrient levels were a little bit lower, it's because the corals may have already kind of had that spike release of the lipids and the proteins. So in actuality, whereas you know scientists have previously thought that uh, the, the bleached corals were emitting the highest level of nutrients, we think that they're actually emitting these nutrients a little earlier than we, we originally thought. So they start to get stressed out and, and release these proteins and lipids earlier on. So it's not so much about digestibility, more so just about when they're releasing the nutrients and when these nutrients are available to these fishes. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, for uh, Mas Eric, uh, if you still have some uh, impression or clarification, please just feel free to let us know. Um, and I have one last question. I said it's last question, um, but this is in Indonesia, so I, I'm trying my best to translate it. So the first is we are from Fikri Shaitao. Um, so he asked, like, we know that uh, we have the um, the um, uh, the climate change and you know the uh, the global changing of the heating and stuff, and then that's uh, also. Um, threatening the fish especially and also with the um, uh, the overfishing as well the question is just oh, e, uh, is the molecular method uh, can be used to um, to what do you call it uh, uh, predict the organism that which organism that being trapped by the uh, global warming? And then the second is, is there any method to, um, to, pre uh, to estimate the number of the population of that threatening, uh, threatening species? Mm -hmm. um, so this is something we primarily do with theoretical modeling. And um, there are two different approaches you can take with that. Um, the first one is making it completely random. So you randomize in the models what species are lost. And so that doesn't take into account vulnerability. Um, that's one of the main ways we've been doing it in the past. Um, mm -hmm. However, there are some good metrics that show um, levels of vulnerability. And some of those indices are predicted and available on databases like FishBase. And so you can integrate that in your model. And um, for instance, there's a researcher called Nick Graham, and he is able, or he published a paper that showed um, how he estimates vulnerability in some of these fishes. And oftentimes it's bigger predatory fishes or very specialized fishes that rely on just a few different items that it eats, because if that one thing disappears, it doesn't have anything left. So oftentimes, things like the obligate corallivores that we talked about um, that must eat corals or they have no option. Um, these are the most vulnerable. So you can weigh that into your models and that can predict um, which species are more vulnerable to extinction. And that's a really nice way to do the models. Um, but we do have gaps in the data. So there's a lot we can do to improve those databases. Um, what about the uh, the predict of the, the population number? Um, I know that a couple of uh, methods that we can use. Can you just give us some insight with like one of them? Population numbers yes. of, uh, the, under well, the threat of yeah. climate change. Yeah, well, we, we can uh, predict that it's not only the threatening, but you know, uh, as a face or population as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know what the method that we usually use uh, for predicting the population number? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it really depends what scale you're doing that at. So if it's on a single coral reef, um, there could be, I mean, if you have long-term surveys, you could get ideas of community level population numbers. And then examining that over time, um, you can kind of predict biomass declines. Um, kind of like we did with the butterfly fish surveys over time um, and, and getting 
um, estimates based on unit area of how many fishes occur in a, in a discrete area and whether that's declining over time. But um, sometimes that's some of the more challenging data to get because it really does take a lot of observation hours underwater to gather full community data. And sometimes it's seen as the simplest thing to look at, but sometimes it's the hardest work to get those data points. Yeah, that's true though, uh, because sometimes um, our interest not only the, um, the small population of fish in the river fish, but sometimes we're interested with the, you know, the, the tuna, maybe uh, mm -hmm. um, very, um, you know, the high, uh, what do you call it, um, migratory animals mm -hmm. as well. Okay, Their time. <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, Fikri, uh, Saikal, jadi memang ada beberapa uh, pendekatan yang bisa dilakukan, tapi yang paling sering itu umumnya adalah dengan pemodelan. Jadi kita bisa memodelkan uh, mana yang kita anggap uh, di, apa, terancam, uh, dan tapi kita bisa mengangkatnya secara random. Jadi tidak langsung point out spesies mana yang terancam. Yang kedua adalah data-data itu juga bisa kita lihat di fish base. Jadi fish base punya beberapa uh, penjelasan tentang spesies apa, kemudian bagaimana uh, apa namanya level of vulnerability-nya, apa yang menyebabkan dia menjadi vulnerable. Jadi kita mungkin bisa uh, melihat dari situ. Yang kedua mengenai populasi, um, ada banyak metode terutama untuk visual census. Jadi directly uh, menghitung berapa banyak per area unit, kemudian kita juga kalau tadi pendekatannya Jordan ada tentang uh, memprediksi penurunan biomasa dari uh, apa. Jadi ini benar-benar a whole complex ecological unit yang harus kita lihat uh, untuk mengetahui apakah uh, spesies itu terancam dan kemungkinan untuk berada di lingkungan itu seberapa banyak nanti. Itu prediksi. Um, Oke. Okay. Uh, that's uh, that's all the question that I have from the chat. Just last um, last attempt to ask just one question. If you want to get directly asking Georgia the question, it doesn't have to be very scientific. Um, okay, so Eric, um, Eric is first hand. Eric, do you wanna say something? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Dita, for taking up your uh, an, uh, a time. Uh, I would no like worry. to. Okay, I would like to ask uh, Professor Casey uh, about more in the methodological uh, 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 in the methodological topic. Uh, my question is: Do you uh, did you do the uh, visual confirmation on the gut content before you uh, you did the uh, DNA metagenomic analysis of the gut content? Uh, so, and uh, and did you also look at the feeding behavior of the species before? Uh, confirming that uh, this is from the meta marketing data. And maybe that's uh, my another question. I'm sorry for asking too much questions. No worry, no worry. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, those are both great questions. Um, definitely worthwhile things doing that can complement the meta barcoding data. In the last study that I presented, I did not do visual gut content analysis or behavioral observations um, because I was working with 2,000 individuals and um, it was <laughs> and, uh, 250 species. It was a very overwhelming project. Um, so we decided just to focus on the gut content metabarcoding and stabilized tobe approach. Um, but I'm currently working on a project in Panama and we're doing behavioral observations, visual gut content analysis, gut content metabarcoding and stable isotope analysis. So you can kind of combine all of them together and see um, you know, if they're all consistent and if they reflect each other accurately. So that's a really great way to ground truth whether the methods are working as you expect them to. So very good question. Awesome. Thank you, Professor Casey. Uh, that must be rough for doing the data analysis. <laughs> Too much data. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> It seems like you're interested in data analysis. You can come to my lab. I will clean this, Dr. Dita. <laughs> okay, so um, I think um, it's been a one and a half um, hour, um, and it's uh, we got a lot of questions. I'm sure there's a lot of questions that will be asked uh, after this. Um, if you guys still want to have a question. 
to Dr. Uh, Jordan Casey or uh, maybe I can help uh, to deliver the question to her. Just ask me a question. I will be in the class, I will be around, I will be in the lab. So please do. And um, this is, um, some of you might think that this is too um, high level of research, but the thing is we want you to be, you know, um, to be knowing, to be understand that this is the research out there. And um, because mostly of you is the undergrad, if you're thinking about doing the, your master's degree or PhD degree, this is the people that you can reach out. You can ask a question or maybe become their student as well. That would be great. So um, for that, I just want to say thank you, Jordan, for coming and for delivering us such a, a great, great uh, presentation. Um, I really hope that we can work with you in the future. I, I will, I think I will. <laughs> I promise you, I will just like asking if can we do some project together. But um, so uh, I don't think Prof. Sapa is still here, but I just want to say thank you for everybody. Before it's not finished yet, I just want to make sure everybody uh, absence. So you have to just, uh, and then the last one, I think I will give it back to Latina and then and we're not really taking a picture together. I think maybe you will get agenda for that. Okay. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, just stay for a couple of minutes and then we can wrap up everything. Thank you, everybody. Back to you, Latina. Okay. Thank you very much for Dr. Jordan Casey and also Ibu Dita Cahyani for having us to guide us in a really interesting discussion. <clears throat> I'm sorry. So there is some souvenir as an appreciation gift for Dr. Jordan Casey from Biology Department of Gidiponegoro University. And it is a certificate going to be delivered or given by Ibu Dita Cahyani. So I'm giving it back to Ibu Dita once again. Uh, so Jordan, we cannot give you any fancy things uh, but we do want to invite you to come uh, back to Indonesia, but now to Semarang. That's a totally different thing, a different place from Bali. But uh, as a as an appreciation for your time, and if, um, I just we from the Department of Biology want to give you the certificate uh, for uh, as the a speaker uh, for our keynote speaker in the event in the biological department. Thank you so much. Again, it's not a fancy thing. Just a small thing from us, and thank you, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking with all of you. Okay, thank you. Miss Latina, you can continue. Okay, uh, now the appreciation you've already been given to Dr. Jordan. We're going to have a documentation session, which I am going to give uh, to have. Uh, the screen being screen the screen uh, being screenshotted. So it's basically us taking pictures, but through this meeting. So maybe for everyone here who able to open your camera, please do so so we could see your face, your beautiful and handsome faces in the screen. Okay. So we can everybody. Waiting. Yeah. That's For okay. Everyone. Maybe not everybody wants to. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna take the picture. So don't forget to pose. One, two, three. Okay, I've already screenshot the screen. Maybe once more for everyone who haven't been in the frame before. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, thank you very much for everyone who already opened your camera and participate along. So maybe as you could see, we are proceeding to our last session today, which is the closing session. First of all, uh, maybe I would like to say thank you very much for Dr. Jordan Casey. Now it's really late in USA, 
thank you very much for giving us insightful knowledge uh, and also i would like to say thank you very much for ibu dita cahyani for guiding us through the discussion and moderate today's discussion. And then I would like to say thank you very much for Biology Department of Diponegoro University for holding this event. And last but not least, I would like to say thank you very much for every participants who attend today's International Thematic Lecture Series 2. So um, I would like, if there is any mistake or any discomfort caused during this event being held, I would deeply apologize for it and we will definitely improve uh, for the next lecture series uh, and i would also once again maybe it's already been brought up by ibu dita but for every participant please uh fill out the attendance list for visiting this lecture um, series and now uh, will that being said that's gonna mark our last session in today's uh international thematic lecture series too uh hope for everyone's success here. Maybe we could meet again in the next occasion with Dr. Jordan Casey and also for everyone here today. Uh, please anticipate for another upcoming lecture series uh, held by Biology Department di Panagoro University. So without further ado, I hope everyone having a really good day ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Lefina. Thank you. Uh, Jordan, can you uh, stay for a couple of minutes? I want to um, introduce you to um, Pak Ruli Rahardian. Um, mm -hmm. So Pak Ruli is actually our, um, the head of our